Instead of, you know, we just dove in with the Yemenites. You look at their sitter or their Kulashim, slightly confusing, right? Why? Because the Nikud is different. Why is the Nikud different? Because... No, that, that's that, that's not the real reason. Although there are Yemenites today, people who are told, yeah, just pronounce a Segol like a Patach, which is inaccurate. It's an oversimplification. Their Segol is actually not a Patach sound, but if it's a sound that exists in English, but not in modern Hebrew. So that's the problem. We talked about this Sephardic types or modern Israeli types who only know five vowels. Their spoken language has only five vowels to choose from. So they describe a system that has many more vowels in terms of the five vowels they know. So that's obviously going to lead to problems. You know, you can't explain, you know, it's like a person who had his Crayola box only has six colors. How are you going to explain to him all the nuanced colors in the middle? You're not going to be able to, you know, he, he can't do it and he can't create those colors. So you remember Crayola? Yeah. Okay. Good. Used to I remember the ones the sixty four pack that was great for for an artistic child, sixty four different shades of colors, and then the hundred twenty eight pack. Wow. So that's a good muscle for many other things. So trying to explain, we discussed before the vowels to someone who doesn't have, you know, the vocabulary, or his he doesn't have lexicon, he doesn't have those tools at his disposal, doesn't know what to do with them. The Yemenite vowelization where they put the dots in the Sidurim and Chumashim is different because they are trying to transpose their own old Yemenite traditions. Yemenite texts don't use the Masoretic vowels. They, are, they have a text that uses a system that reflects the way they were pronouncing back in the olden days. So too with Spartan. The Sephardic, so-called Sephardic, the Eastern pronunciation, let's say in Bavel and places, reflects the Babylonian way of, sorry, the Babylonian way of how they used to mark the vowels reflects more of the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. That's why you have the overlap, the kamats and patach half the time, and kamats and kolam half the time. That's the way Sephardim is really pronounced it. Kolam is, kamats is either this or that. Ashkenazim have it, it's something in between patach and kolam, right? Mm -hmm. And even then, among Radakians and the Gra, there's actually two forms of kamats. So kamats is a spectrum between patach and kolam. But for Sephardim, it's just, there's the ah sound and the aw oh sound, and that's all you got. And you have to spread it across three different symbols and across one symbol that you say has two different functions. So it's a little bit of a problem. So too, with the Yemenite way of pronouncing things, they have taken the Masoretic sort of Ashkenazic way of vowelizing things, and they transpose that onto the classical texts in the way that they pronounce it. So you're going to get some discrepancies. Okay. You're going to get a few discrepancies. For example, a lot of, uh, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, normally when we have a, a P-L verb, this is the usual form, okay? So you give me an example of that, the bear. We have a tsere there, right? In the past tense, this is supposed to be a tsere, okay? Sometimes in the Torah, it's actually with the segol also, but usually there's a reason for that exception because this is the accented syllable. When the syllable's not accented, you might have a case like this, D bear low or something like that. So because the accent shifts over here, you get a, a smaller vowel over here, the closed syllable that's right before it. Okay. That's what you'll have in Tiberian system. In the, uh, what do you call it? In the Yemenite system, you might just have these PL verbs always just have the segol. Okay? Stom, it'll appear like that. Now, in Ashkenazic ways, you could have a verb like this, kiem, which by the way isn't oldest Hebrew. This is a post-exilic verb, kiem. It used to be lahakim in the Hifil. So it became a PL, you know, let's say, uh, Miguel Esther. So kiem. And sometimes you'll have it with the pata, kiam, like in the Megillah also. But the Yemenites will have it like this. Kiem, with a segol. That's one of the things they do. Okay? Now that reflects, the fact that the segol reflects the fact that sometimes this verb itself has a patach. Remember, in Yemenite land, segol sounds like a patach. It's somewhere between patach and serei in Yemenite land. So they put a segol. That's one of the things they do. Another thing which I remember arguing with Rabbi Barhim about was something that he likes. And by the way, I like Rambam. Rambam's great. Like Rabbi Rabbi said, that's the ikr of your learning. But I don't like anything the Yemenites do. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable mostly with things they do, except the fact that they read the Targum after the... Uh, after each Pasuk when they read the Torah. They still do that, and it's been a weakening minhug. And uh, they even, the Yemenite rabbis put a, a, a kol kore this week, you know, 
reaffirming we should be reading the Targum as part of the Torah reading because people are dropping it. Question came in. Is it appropriate to use the chat to ask questions? That is a question, and you just use the chat to ask it. So I'll leave it at that. It's like, can I ask you a question? You just did. Well, why didn't you get so uh, yeah, so that's where that's where questions go in the chat. Okay. So one of the things that the Yemenites have is, which for many people alleviates the confusion, is instead of creating a new symbol to tell us where the Shvanah or the Shvanah is, because in our Masoretic texts, we know there's supposed to be a Shvanah. Well, there are certain people deny that. We know there's supposed to be a Shvanah. So when do you have it? When do you don't? Okay. Good question, right? So you usually have to know the rules of where sh the Shavana is. You could have this word over here in Tehillim. And you could say, well, is this a Shavana or Shavanach? So is this is an imperative masculine poetic verb, verb, or is it a past tense female verb? If it's Sha Mara, that's the past tense of, of she guarded. It's the feminine of Shamar. If it's Shomra, generally speaking, it's just the elongated form, the poetic form of Shamor, the imperative to do that verb. Okay? And uh, so how do you know if there is, if there's a Shvanar or Shvanach here? Usually there's a Tom over here, and there'll be a Tom Mishnah over here, Shamira. If this symbol was not here, it would be Shomra. And same thing with this Zachara or Zuchra. Okay? That's just an example. You've seen these rules before, right? Yeah. One of the things the Yemenites have is, no, the sitter says. The sitter says. How did the guy who, who did the sitter do that? Until the 1990s, or until the 1980s, when Art Scroll put out a, a sitter and a moxer, which marked the Shvanan Shvanach, you didn't know. You had to learn the grammar in order to know how it is. So the sitter makes it easier for you. How did the sitter guy know that? No, they have certain rules. In Yemenite land, they just drop the shvanach. shvanach. If the ver, if the word has a shvanach, they're not going to put the shva there. Okay. Yes, chabad is following a different shita altogether. That's why chabad has it differently in their kahut or kahut sitters, the ones with their official stamp. Uh, the chabad sitters are using a different shita altogether, not like the radak and not like the bra. And uh, I don't like that other shita. We could discuss it. You could find explications. Uh, who is that fellow, the Smith, who wrote a few books about this, is uh, one of the still living proponents of that other shita, which, uh, by the way, I don't think it fits the Masoretic shita, so we're not going to discuss it now. Here's how it goes. The Yemenites, their Sidorim just say that if this was a Shvanah, you don't even have to put the Shvan there. Shomra. Now you know it's a Shvanah. If this was a Shvanah, there'd be a Shvanah there. So here's how they spell the word lifnei. Notice what's what's missing. Lifnei. You're supposed to know the fe has no nikud. It has no shava. So it's with a shava nach. It's nach. It doesn't need it. But Simple enough, right? Doesn't that make things more difficult for you in other places? Yes, and that's why I don't like it. Where are the places it doesn't it makes it more difficult? Well, there are certain places where lack of lack of a shva no. Um the lack of a shva nach would mean that the word the letter isn't felt whatsoever, whereas the shva nach yeah. tells you should feel the yes, the nach nistar letters. I'll give a few examples. Okay. Especially this occurs the most with olives and haze in the middle of a word. If I show you this word, everybody knows this word. The olive is silent. Okay. And in this word, the Aleph is silent. This is standard Masoretic Ashkenazic Nikud. The Aleph has no Nikud whatsoever because it's totally silent in this word. Right? Okay. So that's Zot and Rosh. Very good. You have other words where the Aleph actually has a Shavat Nach according to our tradition. For example, Yagdil Torah with Yagdir. We've discussed this example before. According to our tradition, this is not a silent aleph. This aleph breaks between this syllable, the ya syllable and the dir syllable. Nafkamina, because this is a shvanach in the end of the syllable, this dalid doesn't have a dagesh chazak that doubles the dalid. This is just an ordinary dalid with a dagesh kal, indicating that the dalid starts its new syllable after a previously closed syllable. 
This is a Dagish call, it's just D and not the. Okay? If it didn't have a dot in it. And it's not pronounced with the silent alpha. This, if this alpha is silent, it'd be Yadir, a Dagish Chazak, doubling the dollar. So that's one example. If you do Yemenite style, though, what do they have in their Sidurim? The Shva is gone. And now the Aleph is silent. And now you have the Havamina that this Dalid has the Gesh Chazak doubling this Dalid. Other examples. Nedar Bakodesh. In our traditions, this is a Segol followed by Shva Nach. Nedar. Nafkamina. If this island Aleph was actually silent, this Dalit would have a Dagesh Chazak. That's what this would indicate. But this Aleph is closing the syllable. It's like a consonant. So this is net dar. That's how it should be pronounced. Or if you're pronouncing it more like a like an ass sound, net dar. I, I, I agree. I think that this is the one of few examples where you actually have the ass sound. One way of thinking of the segol is like the a, ah, as in cam, if you're an if you're an English speaker. There are many, many claim that. That's a Yemenite type of thing. And it's a ray is just an eh sound. I don't believe that. I, I've seen arguments for and against you know, all the different ways. I believe that when you have a segol with a shvanach afterwards like this, in, in a shvan, yeah, shvanach with an aleph, that's when it becomes na. Yeah, that's that's what it does to it. So in this case, the Yemenite sidurim just have nothing there. And that's a problem. Then you think it's a totally silent aleph. Same thing with haze in this uh Example, you could have a word like this, which is related, nehdar. Once again, this is a hey with a shiva in the middle of a word. It's not a shiva na, in which case it would be a schataf segol or schataf patak or something like that. This hey absorbs the segol of the nun, nehdar. It is analogous to a mapik hey at the end of a word. For example, this word over here. I'm not putting the mapik there. Without the mapik, this is not a holy name. This is just a female given name in Hebrew. Okay? okay? We have examples. So this is pronounced hallelujah. Now, what's going on here? The Yemenite way, our way uh, in the Tanakh is, there's a mapik hey over here. You're supposed to pronounce this hey, right? This is the equivalent of, of a mapik hey in the middle of the word. This is supposed to be pronounced nehdar. Okay? That's how it's supposed to be pronounced. There are other examples maybe someone else could give us of a shiva hey in the middle of a word. Why does it not have a dot? Because if it had a dot, it would be kodesh, and then I could not erase it. So I'm writing shame kol without the dot, indicating that this is just one name, and it's just a personal name. For example, I could spell this. Watch this. Now, this name is combined of two of God's names, pieces of thereof. But it is not holy, and I can erase this. Why? Because it is a given name. In this combination of letters, it's not holy. Make sense? You could, you could erase Eliyahu's name. Same thing also with uh, this guy's name. Hananiah. I'm not so worried about that. It's not holy. You understand? It's just a given Hebrew name, even though it means God graced. Okay, someone's saying an answer. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's people are saying names. I don't. I don't care what people do. My my job is to explain what the facts are here. So this is a hey that is pronounced. A hey with the shavah in the middle of a word is pronounced like any other consonant that absorbs the previous syllable. The problem with the Yemenite sidurim is they take away the shavah and then you get silent hey in the middle. And by the way, there are words rarely. It's more often that the olive is silent in the middle of a word, but there's certain given names in the Torah that the hay is there and it's silent. Those examples most well known are these names. Silent hay in the word kidatsur. And also this. This name in Sefer Shmuel a few times, Asael. Okay? The hay is silent. The problem is, with, like I said, with the Yemenite system of taking out the Shiva Nach, you don't know if these olives or haze are completely silent in the middle of the word or not. And the biggest biggie is a name we discussed before, 
Jacob's eighth son, what was his name? Yeah, Yisachar. How do you know that? You have to calculate it. Who was older than Yisachar? Well, Reuven Shim, uh, says Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehudo were also, also older. I, but so were Don and Aftali. Okay? I sort of cheated because I knew you were talking about missing letters. Okay. Uh, letters. Missing letter. Uh, it turns out, I think, God is also older than Yisachar. Okay? Don, Naftali, and God, aside from the four older sons of Leah, were born before Yisachar. Okay? So we have seven sons before him. He was the eighth. Yosef was the was the was the ninth. Zebulun was younger than Yosef, as we like to point out. Okay, look at this. This name is we pronounce this Yisachar, and our tradition has it in the Masoretic texts that the sin, the second one, if it is a sin, has no nikud. It doesn't even have the dot indicating if it's a sin or shin, and no shavar or any any word. So some mistaken Hasidim based on a medrash. Started pronouncing this word Yisachar as low. There's supposed to be a Shiva over here and another dot. That's how they pronounce it mistakenly. They just add Nikud. So we tell them, no, there is no Nikud to this letter because in our tradition, this letter is completely silent, unpronounced, as though we we're an olive or hay in the middle of a word without Nikud. Okay? That's the way it's supposed to be pronounced. However, when you see this in the Yemenite sitter, this just looks like any other sin or shin with a Shiva, Nach. So you're going to lead to people pronouncing this as Yisachar. They'll 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 assume you know it's this one is a sin. You don't have any sins or shins next to each other in Tanakh. In natural words, you have a word, let's say that begins with a, sh a sin and has and a shin prefix to it. So you have a thing like that, but usually you don't have sins or shins consecutive. Exactly. And if you do, or shin, one or the other. If they're consecutive, there are they're the same they're the same brand. They're either sins or shins, but not. You know, a mix and match. I think there's one exception at the top. So that's the problem with the Yemenite system. It would lead to Yemenites reading this name as Yisachar. And I don't know of any who do it, but I don't hang with them often enough. I guess it's just uh, if they had better tunes, I guess, in the synagogue would be more appealing, but they don't. You know? Right, yeah. It all sounds like, and also the way, and I think also they, they rush through, you know, especially the ones here. It's just like, it's like almost a competition, like how fast they could, you know, spit out the words. Yeah, whatever. Okay, that's a uh, that's enough for this now. So that's my gripe. If you can call that a gripe, okay. <laughs>